to the future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. Hi, everybody. It's me, the Fedge, host of Inside the Eye Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the feds, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Rev. Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm your host, Janet Kira Lesson, with my co host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And we have a very special guest for you today, listeners. Ken, or Len Caston is a, a dear friend of ours. We've known him for a number, number of years. He's a um, investigator, author. Len Caston has a BA degree from Cornell University, where he majored in psychology and minored in literature and philosophy. He got uh, through Cornell, he entered the U.S. Air Force Aviation Cadet Program, and while in the Air Force, he experienced a UFO encounter that had transformed, had a transformative effect on his life, although he didn't realize it until a few years later. So after serving in the Air Force, he moved to Richmond, Virginia, and he frequented the Association for Research and Enlightenment, which is the Edgar Casey Foundation, and he started to study metaphysics. Then he moved to Boston and later to Washington, D.C. in the 60s. And he felt drawn to join the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, NICAP. And NICAP was the most prestigious prestigious organization in the country investigating UFO phenomena. So NICAP was able to provide solid told that evidence to the press, which had the effect of embarrassing the government into beginning its own serious UFO investigation program, which is the now infamous infamous Project Blue Book. And then back in 96, uh, Lenz living in Richmond, and he began writing feature articles for Atlantis Rising magazine. And now, by this time, like many of us out there, he got deeply involved in UFO research, and uh, most of his articles became UFO-related. And let's see, Len has written two books that we're going to focus on today, The Secret Journey to the Planet, to Planet Serpo, A True Story of Interplanetary Travel, and we're going to go into this in depth, but in depth, but it documents how 12 people as part of a top U.S. secret government program traveled to the planet Serpo and lived there for 13 years. And this book is based on the debriefing of the Serpo team and the diary of the expedition's commander. And the, the other book that Len has written is The Secret History of Extraterrestrials, Advanced Technology, and the Coming new race and this explores the roles of ETs in the military, government, technology, history and the coming new age 
Dr. Lesson, would you like to say anything before we bring on Lynn? Yeah, this is a, a really exciting program um, for me because one of the uh, uh, per working with uh, has been in contact with the uh, Serpo uh, Grays and military and uh, on Johnson under Johnson Atoll, and so uh, everything I can learn about this will really uh, be real exciting to me. <laughs> Len, are you there? Uh, yes, yes, I am. I'm here. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. It's such an honor to have you here. Great to be here, Janet. Would you like to uh, start with the Planet Serpo book? And oh, first of all, is there anything else you want to tell our listeners about yourself that they might uh, enjoy hearing about who you are and how you got into this? Well, I just well. Like Bring, bring, bring the audience up to date on my current uh, writings. I'm writing for New Dawn magazine now in Australia and New Zealand, and uh, have written about uh, 12 articles already for New Dawn. Wow. Yeah. Is that an online uh, art, a newspaper? News no, one, no, it's a regular okay. magazine. Very, regular very magazine. Much, okay. Very much like Atlantis Rising. Same kind of magazine. So no one can get it unless they subscribe. Okay. Well, they can they can buy it in New Zealand and, and Australia on, at bookstores, but not here. Uh, they have to subscribe in the U.S. Okay, and so uh, are, are you working on another book or just doing more articles? Well, I'm I'm sketching one out in my mind. I'm, I'm I'll have one. I'm going to have this put together shortly, but right at the moment, I'm not ready yet. Well, that's fine. So, uh, would you like to begin with the secret journey to planet Serpo and uh, explain to our listeners what this is about? I'm sure many have heard of this before, but you have thoroughly investigated this, and this is uh, one of the best books on the subject out there. So, please do tell us, uh, outline what what happened. What's going on here? As far as I know, it's the only book out there right now. And it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know of any others, right? But of course, the website still remains in, intact. Um, yeah, well, it was it was an amazing program that took place in the '60s and uh, remained totally classified for 25 years until after that 25th year, the DIA was free to release the information because uh, it was no longer classified and. That's that's what began the website, uh, www.serpo.org. Len, maintain a constant distance uh, to your mic. You keep going loud and soft. Okay, I I want to. There sure. you go. There you go. Right there. Perfect. Okay. Next. Okay, so you're saying this is now declassified because it's 25 years after this program is that what you're saying yeah that's when they became that's when they were free to go ahead and uh, and release the information and they chose to release it to an insider network of uh, of, of uh, email an email listing uh, moderated by Victor Martinez and uh, wow. they, chose, they chose to do it that way for a number of reasons they didn't feel it would be accepted they thought it would be ridiculed if they released it to the uh, to the mainstream media, which it would have been probably. I mean, who's the they? Yeah, who, who's the they that released this? The the, the so-called DIA six. These are which six is? six current and former members of the DIA who were involved with the program when it took place. That's, DIA stands for Defense Intelligence Agency, correct? Yes, that's correct. They were in charge of the Serpo program. Well, let's, yeah, so you're saying it started in 65. I'm reading your description um, that Kennedy, President Kennedy, knew about this and set this in motion. So that means Kennedy wasn't shot because he knew about the aliens, or was he? You know, this is interesting. Well, I'm not going to take that position. Uh, okay. Some people do believe that. Uh, he, was, he was assassinated five months before the landing in April of, uh, of uh, 1964. So, I don't know. Perhaps he had it in mind to make it public. I don't know. Uh -huh. that, that will remain forever unknown. Uh, you know, what about the bugaboo that uh, they're always afraid to release things because the Russians will learn it and uh, we won't have a leg up on them in terms of destruction. I'm surprised they let anything like reverse engineering uh, out like this. 
Well, of course, we didn't release any details about the reverse engineering program, and we didn't need to because if you read my book, you'll learn that the reverse engineering took place really in 1953, oh. which, was, which was 11 years before the landing. This all started with Roswell. We have to, we have to go back to Roswell. Cool. That's where it began. And your, your mic is breaking up again, so try adjusting a little bit. And Kiss it. <laughs> okay, I got it right up to my mouth right now. Okay, that, that might be it. Maybe it's too close. Cause you're oh, hitting. okay. How about right here? Uh, no, try again. Okay, how about right here? That's perfect. 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 Okay, okay, good. So uh, the story remained unknown until 19, until 2005 when... Uh, one of the DIA six who called himself anonymous uh, started sending a series of emails to the Victor Martinez website, and th this uh, website is—it's is, really an email list. It's not a website, and at that time it had about 150 members, most of whom were insiders, either intelligence or military. So he was revealing it to the right people. And no sooner did he start sending those emails, and two people, two members of the network, immediately responded and said that they were astounded that he was able to release such top secret information because they had known about it too. So that that started the ball rolling. So so tell us about this. It was a program that was set in motion by Kennedy in '62. And, and tell us the details. What happened on this? Well, we're going back to Roswell, Jack. Oh yeah, we're going back to Roswell. Back to Roswell. What happened in Roswell? Well, one there was one alien survivor of the Roswell crash. Actually, it was not a crash; it was a collision. Two two alien spacecraft collided 75 miles northwest of Roswell. One of them crashed nearby into an embankment, as we all know. The other one limped on westward to Dayteal, and uh, the, the first one was discovered immediately. Uh, the Brazel, the Brazel Ranch, uh, all of the, the, the debris and so forth. The other one was not discovered for two years until 1949. So, uh, but according to the CIA, who uh, who revealed this information to President Reagan in 1981. Both craft contained identical aliens. They looked the same. They were of the same species. The spaceships were the same. Everything was the same. So clearly, they had made a big mistake, and they collided and crashed into each other, and uh, that's what caused that's what caused the whole thing. So of the of the five of the of the uh, aliens that crashed near Roswell, five were dead and one survived. And that survivor started this whole ball in motion. This whole thing in motion. So uh, we've heard a lot of different variations on the Roswell crash over the years and the different people we've interviewed, and uh, so this is very interesting. Um, some people say it was brought down. Some people say it was delivered on purpose. Uh, there was supposed to be a sick crap that was um, – it, hole and then so then, then we have Kingman the, uh, Arizona too. Yeah, we have the well, we're just talking about Roswell right now. And then we have um, the story of Errol the Gray uh, by Lawrence Spencer, who has the um, the nurses so uh, uh, documentation that was the one that was interviewed. Anyway, so this seems like a different variation, but I they're probably all true and, and things are all mixed in together, just like everything gets. Um, but you're saying this is the one that happened the first uh, week of uh, July in 1947. So what's the Serpo Gray look like? Wait, let me get the answer to that question. So this was July of 47, correct, that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's what it happened. Uh, the, uh, the alien that survived was taken to Los Alamos and uh -huh. uh, was questioned by the scientists of Los Alamos. But, but the... Uh, the, 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 it was definitely a collision, and it happened during a lightning storm. And perhaps the uh, the very, very powerful radar that the uh, 509 bomb group was using at that time may have had something to do with it as well. Uh huh. But in any case, this this particular version that I'm giving you is the version that was given to President Reagan in 1981 uh, when he was briefed by the CIA. 
And that's all on tape. That's all on tape. That entire that entire debriefing. Wow. So is that uh, on tape, Matt? Is that something we could look at, or is that secret? Here. Well, I make reference to it in the book. Okay. And I quoted I quoted the entire debriefing verbatim. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Okay. By Len's book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get the book, and you can read it. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, that's the authentic version of the Roswell crash because it's being given to Reagan by a, a top CIA guy who's been involved with uh, extraterrestrial contact for many, many years. Well, that's fascinating because we were told that the, those presidents were no longer in the loop, but now Reagan is still in the loop and he's getting the information. Okay, so continue. Well, that's that's what was reported on the Serpo website in 2005. Uh huh. That's, that's where all the information came from, and that's ma mainly where a lot of my the material in my book was based on. So uh, it, it all came out in 2005 by that series of emails sent in by anonymous to to that UFO threaded email network. That's how it all began. Uh huh. That's how the revelation began. And uh, Anonymous continued to send in the emails. He sent in a total of 21 original emails and then sent in another batch later. But meanwhile, others who were involved or knew about the program started sending in additional information uh, also anonymously and fleshing out, fleshing out the whole story. So uh, people who had trained the 12 people started sending in information. People who knew about them uh, started sending in information. So it became... Far more, so that that really vindicated Anonymous in his choice of how to reveal the information, because it uh -huh. turned out to be the best way to do it. So this is serpo.org, S-E-R-P-O.org, and it still exists, and people can follow that thread. It's still out there. It's about sixteen thousand words, but it's very confusing to read and very, very disorganized. You have to uh, plow through it. Uh huh. But it's still out there. It was gone for a while. Uh, I thought it was necessary and important that I do the book because I knew the website could disappear overnight. And once Great. that happened, and once that happened, the whole story was gone. All right. So you started to really research. What got you into the researching this book? What was your inspiration besides the website? Was there something else? Bill Ryan. I met with Bill Ryan at the 2006 Laughlin Conference. Uh, UFO Congress and sat with him in that uh, in that shuttle shuttle uh, uh, car from uh, Las Vegas Airport to uh, I'm sorry from Laughlin to Las Vegas Airport, and I heard him talking about it for two hours. So that's what got me going on it. He was giving the story really to 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 uh, to Colonel Don Ware. And I was listening too, and that's that's how I came to know about it directly from Bill Ryan. Bill Ryan was the creator of the website. Ah, and he was the moderator of the website. All right, so uh, and we're getting a little bit of kind of uh, uh, feedback, so maybe we have to back your mouth off a little bit from the mic because it's like when you're breathing, it go into the mic. Okay, so you you were in this uh, thing in 2006 with uh, Bill Ryan and Don. Where we know Don. And so that's probably a fascinating ride. So what did you think about that after you heard all that? Well, I, I was very impressed with Ryan and the way he re related the story. And he had the ring of conviction to it. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of run through things through a filter in my mind. And after I've been, through, I've been through so much of this material for 30 years that I could tell just the way he was talking about it and the level of detail that he had that there was more to this than meets the eye and started doing the research myself. And then I realized that uh, it was most likely true. I was about 95% co convinced that it was. Even though Ryan himself later said he wasn't sure himself, but he never never said he did not, di that he disbelieved it. He just went on to other things, that's all. Okay, so that, I guess uh, let's get into the gist of the book. So tell us more about the book. How do you begin it, and how do you get into this story? Well, 
Well, I thought it was important to just start the story uh, at the beginning, which was really World War II, mm -hmm. because uh, because the Nazi the Nazi base in Antarctica posed a real threat to us, and uh, we did the American military, the Pentagon, did not know how to to respond after after current after uh, Admiral Byrd led uh, Operation High Jump to Antarctica in 1946. He led a fleet, I think you know, he led a fleet of 13 ships, 5,000 right. yes. 5, yeah, 5, Marines, and uh, that was clearly an invasion. It was not a scientific expedition. Uh huh. And Byrd himself said it was a military operation. So, in any case, uh, he was greeted by flying saucers that came right out of the water. When he got to Antarctica, they they killed a lot of Americans and sank. I, my understanding is they sank two ships. I'm not sure exactly what happened. In any case, Bird uh, Bird terminated the operation in two months. It was supposed to have been a six-month operation, and they immediately headed back to Washington to to the U.S. And so who were the, who were who made these uh, UFOs? Were they uh, the Nazis were they the Nazis assisted by uh, extraterrestrials? Out. What's the story behind the the saucers? I should say flying saucers. It was, def it was definitely a Nazi base under the ice in Antarctica. That's that's history. Everybody knows that. They began building that base in 1938, and they sent uh, all kinds of, of uh, experts down there to create the base. And it was under the ice, so it was in a warm water, basically debarkation. And uh, my own personal belief is that it was a joint. It was jointly, it was a joint operation with the reptilians, who really helped the Nazis during World War Two. Uh, okay. So the but, reptilians are helping the Nazis. How did do you have how they got started with each other? Can you go back even one step? Well, how you know the, the the reptilians are fascists in and of themselves, and so it, make, it was it was it made sense that they would try to. Back a fascist regime to take over the world. Okay. Uh, that was that was definitely an attempt to enslave the planet. World War II was an attempt to enslave the planet, and it was jointly uh, carried out by the reptilians. And we know that Hitler sent many expeditions to Tibet. Uh, there was some dealings there with the underground civilization in Tibet. And the reptilians are known to have had a facility there. In any case, what happened probably is that they invited the Nazis to join them in Antarctica because Antarctica was really a base created, I think, for interplanetary operations. It was no, it was no, it was not a refuge for the Nazis. It was a, it was a scientific base for. Uh, Going out and invading and exploring other planets, and the Nazis got in on that. That was their goal. Was uh, it connected with a uh, with a uh, set of uh, connections under the Earth, or a hollow Earth, or a river under the Earth? Or the or the train, the, the high speed transport system. That I don't know. I know we have that in the U.S. I don't know if they had it in Antarctica or not. Very. Right, uh, I had a uh, a, a uh, what do you call it? whistleblower. Tell me how he had gone from Shasta down to Antarctica, but there's another race down. There's other races. There's a peaceful race. I'm just wondering, the reptilians are they indigenous to the Earth in your in your, your cosmology here, or were they did they come from space? Are they Anunnaki? You know what is so? Uh, what is your concept of who these reptilians are that interacted with the Nazis? And the Nazis are human, right? Or are they? Are they uh, humans possessed by reptilians, like David Icke talks about? What's what's your thoughts? I don't know about the possession. Uh, I know that they were probably very closely connected to the Draco. The, 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 that particular group of reptilians, I believe, were from Draco. From Draco. And I think they've been here for thousands of years underground. So, okay. Uh, this was some sort of an overt attempt to take over and enslave the planet in an overt way instead of just doing it uh, behind the scenes. And they got, they got, when they felt they had Japan and Germany lined up to take over the, the heartland, which is the Russian, the Russian uh, heartland, uh, with Japan attacking from one side and Germany from the other, they felt they could take over 
uh, the so-called motherland, and then from there confront the uh, West, the U.S. And, Brit and Britain and France. So the well, they had was, this extraterrestrial technology. Certainly, they had an, enough uh, advantage to take over the planet at that time. Do you have any idea why they backed off? Even and Bird was defeated. Why did they back off and not do an uh, overt takeover, or have they taken over covertly? Well, that's why I started the book there. Okay, mm -hmm. I started the book there because that took place. Operation High Jump took place in December of 1946 and ended in February of 1947. That's when Bird that's when Bird returned to the US and when he gave that interview to the reporter in Chile saying that uh, he encountered the, those flying those flying craft that could travel from co from pole to pole uh, at very very high speeds. He gave that interview to somebody named Benada who worked for a Chilean newspaper and that was published and is still available. In any case, um, Bird was disciplined, or was he was? I would say that he was. Uh, the Congress did not like the fact that he was speaking so freely about it, and uh, after that, he disappeared into a mental institution, and he was never heard from again, as far as I know. He okay. was, he, was cautioned, he was cautioned never to give out any more interviews. I know that. So, in any case, at that point, I think the Congress realized what they were up against. Don't forget, this was early 1947, uh -huh. February or March, and we're probably uh, discussing possible ways they could respond to the Nazi presence and to those craft. Uh, and then, however, three months later, a alien craft crashed into the desert in New Mexico, and it became a whole new ball game. That's the sequence of events. In other words, Do you think they may have fabricated the crash in order to begin interacting with humanity? That was one of the theories. Uh, you mean that would be the motive of the aliens? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, that's one of the theories that we've heard, is that they actually uh, fabricated this crash because we did have these two factions, and uh, the the, um, the alien, the greys call themselves the domain, and they said that the uh, reptilians are the old empire. And so they wanted to uh, assist humanity, and so they, they, the one story we got is they fabricated this crash so that we would start reverse engineering, and that, the, of course, the one survived, and, and um, that gray started interacting with humanity. That's the story. Well, we the, 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 uh, the entities from Zeta Reticuli that crashed at Roswell were not grays. They were not grays. What did they look like? Sasha asked they, that earlier. They were... They were small, about four and a half, five feet. They were brown skinned. They uh, had large eyes, but they didn't have. They had. Uh, they did not look like the greys. They, okay. Their eyes were not like the greys. So those they, aliens they, anywhere? They, we, 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 we called them Ebens, and that was the name that stuck, because somebody said they're extraterrestrial biological entities, and that became Ebens, and that was the name that stuck. Are there any pictures of these greys or, or artist renditions that you have found that best uh, look like what they actually look like? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do. Cynthia Crawford has created a, a, a sculpture of what they look like. And I have that sculpture. Oh. Okay, but you don't have any photos that we could show our listeners on our yeah, website. Yeah, I do. I do have photos, absolutely. Um, okay. Maybe you could send that later and we'll put that on Aquarian Radio website for people to look at later. Yeah, sure, I can do that. No problem. That would be great. But the, uh, the, in the briefing that was given to President Reagan, he described them as having totally different bi biochemistry. Their brains were different. Their physiology was different, although he, they did have five fingers and toes, unlike the greys, who I believe have four. And um, they, uh, they spoke with a very strange screeching sound, uh, they did not speak as we speak, and that caused a lot of problems for communications. But we brought in communications people to Los Alamos from all over the world to try and communicate with them. And and one of the top experts said that after six months of 18 people trying to understand their language, he was convinced that none of us understood a single word of it. Wow. 
So how did they get through to understand what this uh, what, the Eben, we'll call it Eben, was uh, saying? They're not telepathic. These they they have vocal cords. You're saying they they didn't have vocal cords such as we do, but they were able to communicate through through speech in a way because they use a communicate they use a uh, tonal tonal variations very much like in close encounters very similar okay uh, the commander of the team said it sounded like high speed high like um, high pitched screaming okay when they, would speak, when they would speak to each other and so so how did they get around this uh, communication barrier or did they well they they were able to teach two or three of them to speak english and one of them became the key a woman a female and she was the key, and she she became a very valuable resource uh, to the team while they were there on Serpo. Okay, so before we're, we're, I thought we're back in '47 with the gray that survived. I'm sorry, we were suddenly at, at Serpo. This gray that survived, were they able to? I'm not I'm sorry. This even that survived. Sorry, correct my term. Were they able to? How did they get through to communicate with this even? Taught her English. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. We taught them English, and uh, the uh, the even lived for another five years after after he survived. So he stayed alive until the summer of 1952. And during that time, we did succeed in making great strides in communication because we had a complete lexicon of their language, and we had sent uh, we had discovered a communications device on the Roswell craft. That permitted him to speak to communicate with his home planet. Woo! Great. Yeah, and he sent six messages to his planet prior to his death. Most of which were in towards the latter end of his life. Uh, he died in the summer of 1952. He sent six messages, and one of those messages was a proposal for an exchange program. Now. That proposal was made that early in the game, presumably because it had been okayed by Eisenhower. Uh, I'm sure that the military handler who handled the uh, the Eben, who we began to call EB number one, uh, was not able to make that commitment himself unless he was passing it on from Eisenhower. So that's my guess is that it was officially sanctioned that there be an exchange program. As one of those one of those six messages that he sent to his planet. Now he did get an answer back, but the answer he got was so garbled and kind of strange. It it, it said it, it agreed to the exchange program, but it it put it ten years off into the future. Wow. And the, the Americans were confused by that, but before they could clarify it, he died. Uh huh. So we were now on our own. We had the device. We were able to communicate with his planet, and uh, we were teaching them English. So communications began to get better and better. And by the time Kennedy became president uh, in 1962, we had achieved a pretty good working relationship in terms of communicating with his home planet. Okay. So Kennedy's now president. The Ebens are learning English. They're communicating on a regular basis. Was the communication um, instantaneous or was it delayed? It wasn't instantaneous, no. no. Okay. We, after, after they came back from Serpo, we developed a, a much improved system using chemical lasers to push the signals uh, through the galaxy. But prior to that, I think that it took quite a while for these messages to get back and forth. But now there's so, something else that has to be talked about here. Go for it. After that alien crash in 1947, uh, our people realized very quickly that that small craft could not have traveled throughout the galaxy, which we, we estimated that his home planet was about 38 light years away. Woo! It just wasn't large enough for that kind of interstellar travel, and they concluded that there had to be a mothership in orbit somewhere. And uh -huh. the the evidently that communication 
did take place. Uh, oh, we, communi so we communicated with the mothership, and our suggestion to them was, why don't you send us another craft that we can use for reverse engineering? Uh huh. And they oh, read the, uh, the mothership. Did they did they discover where it is? Was it in our solar system? It, it had to be somewhere in orbit. How far out? I don't have no. I have no idea. I heard that uh, it parks. There's two of them. One parks on the far side of the moon. The other one parks around Mars. But that was another uh, story. So I didn't know if you had any correlations with that. Or, but anyway, you don't really MJ, know. MJ12 realized that that small craft could not have made the journey. So right, makes sense. We asked them to send another craft, and that was the craft that came down in Kingman, Arizona. Uh, in, 19, in 1953, and that was not a crash. That was a landing. That, yeah. that craft. That craft was given to us. It okay, so that's taken 1953. Yeah, we heard those guys were from that uh, landing were taken to the jail in town until the military picked them up, and lots of people saw them. Exactly, there were four live aliens on that craft, and. Uh, they were taken ultimately to Los Alamos to the same place that we had kept uh, EB number one. They had the same quarters there. They were taken by bus there, and we picked up the craft on a tank trailer, a Sherman tank trailer, and hauled it over to the uh, Nevada test site, which was about 200 miles away. It was, head it was heading for the Nevada test site. It landed in the wrong place, and uh -huh. so we had to, we had to take it the rest of the way. We had a they had to ferry it across the Colorado River, and. Uh, it, it was got kind of complicated, but it got to the Nevada test site. So is that the one that Lazar worked on, Bob Lazar worked on in, in uh, Area 51? I think it might have been, but there were other <laughs> there were other craft there. That wasn't the only one. Okay. But the so one we know about. Craft. Yeah, go ahead. We know about this particular one. Because Bill Uhouse, who was an engineer working on the reverse engineering, he identified it as the Kingman craft in his in his monologue, and he worked on it. He worked on the reverse engineering, so uh, we have confirmation that that was the one, that was the main one that we used for reverse engineering. And we well, have. So how, did, how does it work, Len? How, what did they find out? What makes it uh, powered? They have all that information. They have it all, and they had one working by 1962. We had a we had uh, Bill Uhouse's job was to create the train the uh, the uh, training uh, uh, device. Wow. Then, yeah, that was his job was to create the trainer and uh, and make it larger for uh, for us to get into and out of because we're much much taller than they were. Uh, so that whole. It, I've got whole stories in my book uh, under Appendix 10. Wow. It's all there. So we were able to reverse engineer a craft that was large enough for our people to stand up and be in comfortably and for it to travel this uh, 39 light years to the planet no, Serpo. No, no, no. no, no, no. Okay. No. We, we, en we reverse engineered the scout craft. Right. The small one. Okay, so how do they get to, what ship did they use to go to Serpo? Well, when Kennedy became president in 60, in 61, uh, he did not know anything at all about the reverse engineering program. All he knew about was that we had, that we were going to have an exchange program and he okayed the exchange program. Uh, as far as he knew, it was a very, very risky adventure. He had no idea that we had been dealing with them for nine years. Uh, and he, he wasn't privy to that information. Uh, evidently, MJ-12 didn't feel they had to share that part of it with him. All they, want, all they wanted from him was an approval for the exchange program. And, of course, he wanted a triumph and he wanted a, uh, a space triumph very badly at that time. And he, right. He wanted, and so he said, sure, let's do it. When did he do that famous speech where he said, we're going to get to the moon by the end of the century. Do you, do you remember that, Len? That was that was given in, uh, that one I believe was given in 61 after he had talked to Werner von Braun. Uh, that's also in my book. Von Braun told him that he thought we could land on the moon by 1968 or 69 and come back. So based on that conversation with von Braun and with, uh, with uh, Vice President Johnson, uh, it was decided that he could make that speech. 
And then, so he was, when he made that speech, he may not have been aware of this other exchange program. And also, uh, there must have been some awareness that they weren't going to use the same technology for this, uh, the NASA program that they use for this exchange program. Is that correct? There, the exchange program was carried out on an alien craft. Not on, it was not on one of our craft. They picked, okay. they picked up, they picked up our people. They from came. the ground or from the from the mothership? They sent a shuttlecraft. The first landing was in uh, April of 1964, and at that landing, we had the 12 guys ready to go, sitting on a bus. We had 90,000 pounds of equipment and supplies ready to go, but they said, "No, we can't do that now. We're just going to take back our 12 or 11 dead uh, com compatriots." and we'll come back next year for the exchange group. So that posed a tremendous amount of uh, problems because uh, logistically speaking, we had to warehouse all that equipment and the guys had to go back for another year of training. So they came back again in July of 65 and that, that landing was the one that the Spielberg movie was based on. Okay, so the, the uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was based on Spielberg. How did Spielberg get that information to base his movie on? He's never told anybody, but we know that he wrote the screenplay in one weekend. So wow. uh, while closeted while closeted in the Sherry Netherlands Hotel in New York City. And after that was written, it, nobody was able ever able to change another word of it. So he got the information evidently from somebody in the DIA. Uh huh. Who gave it to him. And uh, I have a whole chapter on that in the book. Oh, we have to get this book, everybody. <laughs> All right. So now, uh, then Spielberg got that out, I think, by like 75, the Close Encounters movie. So we're back in July of 65. Um, so who are these people that were on the craft that were selected? And the how 12. were they selected? The 12. Were they men, women, combination? I think there were. According to what was written into the website, there were two women in the initial group uh, of 500, 500 volunteered. They put ads in all the service newspapers, and they had 500 volunteers, out of which they wintered it down to 16, 12, and four alternates. Uh -huh. And some say there were two women in the final cut, but uh, I'm quite convinced now that it was all. It was all men. They were all men. There might. There might have been two, the two of the women. The, the two women might have been in the alternate group. I'm not sure. But they didn't. They didn't go to Serpo. Okay, so it was all men who went to Serpo. Yes. How did they go there? Uh, okay. July July 16th of 1965, the craft landed. Uh, they sent two. They sent two craft into our atmosphere, right on schedule. However, the first one landed at the wrong place. It landed outside of Socorro. And that became the Lani Zamora incident. Do you know that about that incident? No, no tell, tell us. us about it. Well this uh, this New Mexico policeman came upon this craft landed in outside of Socorro with two small men standing next to it. It was a big egg shaped craft and uh, he radioed, radioed it in and uh, Watched it, and no sooner did he, they see him there that they got back into it and took off. And that that incident became one of the incidents that that um, Heineck said convinced him of the reality of the fact that they were visiting us. That's how that's how that's how uh, strongly that that particular event. So that was the one that made the wrong landing. The, uh, they radioed. We radioed their craft and said, "Look, you're in the wrong place." The other craft got the message and landed correctly, and then that craft came back and found the landing place also. So the landing took place um, outside of uh, Holloman Air Force Base. Oh, they always um, use Holloman. Okay. Holloman and Air Force Base, yeah. So so they were egg-shaped? Were they both egg-shaped? I'm oh. sorry, wait, 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 wait. No, the April 64 landing was at Holloman. That became a that became a ceremonial landing because uh, they we exchanged gifts with them. Uh, they gave us a very incredible gift called the Yellow Book at that time, uh, which we can talk about later. Yeah, we'll uh, talk about this later. The Yellow Book. But the one that returned in July came 
came into the Nevada test site. That was the landing. Okay. And, and what did they look like? You said it was egg-shaped? The shuttle craft that landed outside of Socorro, which Zamora saw, was an egg-shaped craft, a rather large shuttle craft. It, it was much larger than a, than a scout craft. Right. Because it was going to hold uh, 12 people, right? And gear. Plus, plus, the, um, plus, plus 90,000 pounds of equipment. Plus 90,000 pounds of equipment. Okay. 45 tons of equipment went with them. And when the commander got into the shuttlecraft, he couldn't believe that they put the entire, all that equipment in one move. They lifted it all in one move. It had, it had 10 motorcycles. They had three Jeeps. They had a ton of tons of equipment. Oh, wow. They evidently had some sort of anti-gravity capability that allowed them to, to load everything onto the shuttlecraft in one, in one move. Amazing. Okay, so they load up this giant shuttle craft. Do we have that anti-gravity uh, ability? Did they? Uh, did we figure that one out? Did they share it or give it to us? I, 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 you have, you have to believe that we do. Of course. How could we yeah. not? They were very generous with all their information. They, they didn't mind sharing all their information with us. So wow. You, I'm sure we have it. We must. And okay. we know that we know that the B-2 bomber is anti-gravity. We have a lot of anti-gravity equipment now. Wow. Okay, so 90,000 pounds of equipment, uh, 12 humans, and I don't know what their, how many people they sent to pilot the craft, and and it was a, how long did it take them to get there? Wait, this is just a shuttle, honey. Oh, this is the shuttle, or is this the craft that they're, they're going to travel this, on? This is, this is the shuttle. The uh-huh. Shuttle picked up the 12 men on July 16th. Uh, uh-huh. And all the equipment, and then the rendezvoused with the mothership. Uh, the commander said that the mothership was huge, absolutely huge. They found themselves standing in a room with a hundred foot ceiling. Woo! Oh my God! That's what he said. That's what he said, and that's in his that's in his diary. So uh, that's everything was then transferred to the mothership, which was in orbit from the shuttlecraft. And they're able to cloak it so we don't see these things. You would think they would be so huge that we would see them from the Earth, but the, they're not visible. I, I, I think the mothership must have been three or 400 miles away in orbit. It was a long way away. Long way away, outside of oh, our view. Absolutely, yeah. They have cloaking technology, too. So right, but they were just far enough out so they wouldn't see them. Exactly. All right. So now everybody's on board ship. So what's go? What happens next? Well, they got they they got on board and they took a ten month journey to Circle. That's Did they happened. tell anybody in their any of these diaries or debriefing uh, documents what it was like being on board their ship for ten months? What their their life was like and their social structure and all that stuff? Yeah, it's all it's all in the book. All, all book. right, <laughs> we didn't read the book. Tell us a little bit about it. I read the book. Well, they, uh, it wasn't like, a very ple- it wasn't a very pleasant journey for initially. Anyway, they got sick a lot. They had to sit in these uh, in these transparent uh, globes where they could be watched, and they were sealed. Every time they got out of the globes or the uh, spheres, they called them spheres, they got sick. And uh, they took a lot of food with them, a lot of sea rations with them. Uh-huh. But they didn't have access to. They didn't have access to the food while they were uh, en route because it was packed away in another part of the uh, ship. Oh, my goodness. So they had to try and get by on the alien. They did have some sea rations in their backpacks, but they they had to try and eat the alien food. They all said it tasted like paper. So uh-huh. it, wasn't, it wasn't very palatable. Uh, what made them sick? Any ideas? Yeah, they were travel. It had to do with the fact that they were going through wormholes. They were going through time, and uh, they got very sick every time they every time they stepped out of the uh, these spheres. But every once in a while, one of the evens would come in and he put a hand on their forehead, and that they felt better after that. And then he waved some kind of a blue light at them. I don't know exactly what that was all about, but uh-huh. uh, they tried to make them comfortable as best they could. 
Was it one person for for per sphere, or was there more than one a person in a sphere? No, one 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 person per sphere. There were twelve of them, twelve spheres, and they were connected to the floor through various wires and lights. Uh, the walls, the, he said, the walls of the room looked like mattresses, but they couldn't tell what they really were made out of. So uh, that was the nature of the trip. It was, uh, when they got to the halfway point, they were given a lot more freedom, and they were, could walk around the ship. And they were allowed into the engine room, and they could actually go anywhere they wanted after that. So half the, half the journey was not unpleasant, but half, the first half evidently was quite, quite unpleasant. Did they say, like, how many people were on this mothership? Was it, you know, 500 or 5,000 or any ideas? The, uh, the Evens were, the, the, com- the control room of the Even craft was at three levels. At the very top level, there was one pilot. And the other levels, there were various um, people sitting at consoles. Uh, and they gave uh, our people a one level to sit at. So uh, they were very, very, very kind to us, very helpful, tried to make us feel at home, and uh, did the best they could. What did they say about the power source when they were in the engine room? What did we learn about that? Well, the commander described it in his diary, and it's very strange looking. It has to do with these metal-looking containers all pointing in around a circle and some kind of a light, high light, a light coming from above. Uh they definitely were using wormhole travel. There's no question about that. And when they went through the wormholes, uh, the travel through the wormholes was instantaneous. So getting to and from, uh, they had to do a certain amount of stellar navigation to get through to and from the wormholes. And that's where the 10 months came in. Because the, the trips through the wormholes themselves was, were instant. They were traveling faster than the speed of light. And you know, let's let's don't rem- let's remember here that um, the Zeta Reticuli system was 39 light years away, and it took them less than a year to get there. That means that they were traveling at approximately 40 times the speed of light for the journey. Wow! Wow! I wanted to look at the motivations. I mean, what's their motivation for helping humans and? and uh, assisting us, or is that their motivation? Because we have the reptilians that are so mean to try to destroy a faction, and then we have these uh, Evens that are helpful. Correct? Well, they, they, they wanted to strike up a diplomatic relationship with, with us. But I guess they felt we were advanced enough now for them to do that. They had been watching us for thousands of years, probably watching, watching us shooting bows and arrows, and living in caves for a long time and saying, hey, let's get out of here. <laughs> There's nothing here for us. Uh, then as we became more and more sophisticated, uh, then came the Roswell incident, and uh, we struck up a relationship with them. We were ready at that point. Did they give us any indication of how the universe is, or the, the solar system or the galaxy is set up uh, with other species, and, and do they have like a federation? What's what's their politics? How what's their society like and their organization? Did they convey that to us? Yeah, they, way- they have traveled all over the galaxy. They, these these guys are real travelers and explorers. So you can just imagine what we've learned from them. Can you just in your wildest dreams imagine what we've learned from a species that has traveled all over the galaxy? And that information is bottled up somewhere in Bowling Air Force Base. So, uh-huh. so what, what did they see when they got to uh, home planet? Right. So it took 10 months to get there. What happened next? They finally arrived. What kind of atmosphere did it have? Did they have to slow down? Did it make a fiery uh, halo like our uh, shuttle does when it comes in? Well, we don't know that. All we know is that the door opened and our people stepped out into the sunshine. <laughs> and, and, re- and just breathed in the regular air. Yes, they had they had the right components of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, exactly almost exactly like our our atmosphere. And that's the reason they've been able to explore our, our Earth for such a long time. So, wow. uh, yeah, they had no problem with the, with the atmosphere. But the heat, did they have they, a city or, very, or, very or airport? What was it? Where did they land? What did it look like? As soon as
soon as, as soon as they stepped off, the commander said it looked like uh, all of dirt. It looked like Arizona, New Mexico. It was all dirt and uh, <laughs> desert, and it was extremely hot. It was about 107 degrees. They uh, they they put them up in an underground cooler location, and they stored all of their gear underground as well. So that helped a lot for them to cool off, and uh, that was the beginning of the great adventure. It lasted 13 wow. years. Yeah. Well, we have a break coming up in one minute. So we, we got to the point where they've landed on this planet, and it's amazing that they would have the same atmosphere, and these are uh, – they they dwell they don't dwell inside the earth they dwell these are um, surface dwellers is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. So what's, do they have buildings? Yeah, like, did they have how, vegetation? How big were they? Yeah. Buildings look kind of primitive to us. They were like adobe, the kind of adobe buildings we might see here, uh, but uh, they had a very sophisticated technology though. Uh, they had aircraft that traveled over the surface of their planet without using anti-gravity. They were like helicopters without without, uh, without the rotating blades. And uh, they had vehicles, land vehicles, that also were anti-gravity. Uh, you know, it, it's all there. It's all there in the book. Okay, great. Um, we're going to be taking a break in just a second here. We're at 56. Here's the music. Okay. <laughs> We're coming. We will be back after Freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. God is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, the heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is mere insanity. And do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslivism.com. 100% listener-supported radio. Reporting from danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Radio. We find that we uh, we detect people. Even if you had a password, it took you 10 minutes to get in, and you still got to find the files. Every Monday. We demand the accident. Started learning codes that night. From 2 to 4 p.m. The idea of having your own computer, a personal computer, was inconceivable. Joy. As we progress through high quality information in all fields. From hacking news to world important issues. Constant the stream of verbal nonsense. There is only one choice, one choice, one chance, one chance. So tune in to the internet and beyond with Count Foster. 
Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm your host, Janet Kier Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we have a very special show today with Len Caston. But before we get back to our show, I just want to remind everybody that Revolution Radio is listener-supported, and would you please go over to the donation button on the website right now and donate what you can, a dollar Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, a hundred, whatever you can donate is greatly appreciated. And thank you very much for your donation. Anything you want to say before we come back to the show? Well, we've just gotten to the place where the uh, exchange guys, twelve of them, have arrived at uh, the uh, planet Serpo, sure. and uh, we are uh, and we we're just talking about what their life is like. What what's what happened there? Well. Um as I as I mentioned in my book, it turned out that they uh, the people lived there in a state of high regimentation. It was sort it was sort of like a police state, really. Uh, they were watched and regimented uh, by their military. Although they didn't carry weapons, they could they could keep them in line in other ways. But evidently it was all peaceful and they didn't need to worry about crime anyway. And so uh, they had a setup, a social setup whereby uh, 
There was no money. Anytime they wanted anything, they went to a central warehouse uh, and took whatever they needed. There were about 650,000 population, very small population, really, on the entire planet. Most of it centered around the, uh, the equator. Uh, How big is this planet? It's a little smaller than Earth, a little smaller than Earth. And the gravity? Gravity, I have all that's in the book. I have the exact numbers. Uh, gravity was, I think, a, a slightly uh, less than ours. Uh-huh. In any now case, they, we were able to walk they around. Jobs? Did, even though they had no money, did they help off of functions. functions that they had to perform for their society? Yes, yes, they all had jobs to do. And they all wore on their belts a little thing that was sort of like, almost like a smartphone that we have, that uh, told them what to do at various times. Uh, they also had a very strange device. They had a 300-foot tower with what looked like a mirror at the top. The commander said that uh, it cast it, it cast down uh, shadows on the ground around the tower, and as it as the year, it rotated, as the planet rotated, those sh those uh, those shadows changed, and every time it changed, the uh, the aliens would start a whole new uh, kind of activity. So it was like they were told what to do at all hours of the day. So this is like a, a, a sundial. Like a sundial, yeah. Only it wasn't really. It was sort of a mirror. He said it was a mirror tower, and he did a sketch of it. Uh, using uh, Draftsman's uh, sketching material, and that sketch is in the book as well. Hey. So they had peace, but at what cost to freedom, right? Yeah. So, but the, they, they seemed to, they didn't mind this uh, regimentation, or, or was there any complaints that they, that about from their society? Did anybody not like the system like we have here in the, in the world? <laughs> There's always yeah, one faction. And evidently, it, evidently not. But it, since it was a police state, and the police would uh, immediately uh, intervene in the event of people not doing what they're supposed to, we can assume that if they if they did have any feelings of revolution, it wasn't manifested while our people were there. What right. kind of domestic uh, or, or family life or sexual life did they have? Did they uh, have mates or multi mates? Yeah. Yes, they had. They had each. They had mates, and they they stayed married together for for their lifetimes. And they had one. They were allowed to have uh, uh, one or two children. And they they told us not to actually snoop around into their private dwellings, but the uh, our people did did anyway. They wanted to see what was going on there, and uh -huh. said said that they. They did sort of have sex very similar to the way we have it, and uh, they were they were very they were really a very gentle people basically, and very kindly and very compassionate people. They, they How long helpful. did it take for them to parturate? I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. But did they give a birth the way? They grew up. Uh, said they they developed the children developed into adults very quickly, much faster than we did. Oh, uh huh, uh huh. How long did they live? Uh, they live longer than we do. I think, as I recall, they could live as long as 300 years. Uh -huh. I wonder, since there was only 650,000, I uh, wonder what was behind uh, just allowing one or two children. Do you have any insight into that? No, they must have had their reasons. I'm not sure what they were. Uh, they had some sort of sophisticated social program. And... Uh, I think they were maybe concerned about overpopulation. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So what did our guys do while they were there? Yeah, well, what, what was their day like? They, they like? were very disciplined. They were all military people, and they carried out, uh, they carried out a program of, of exploration and investigation for the entire time they were there. Now, after the first um, seven years... It turned out that the northern quadrant, the the uh, the climate was much more mild and cooler up there, and they told them they would prefer to live up there, and so they built a community for our people up there in the northern quadrant, 
uh, that they called they they christened it Little Montana because it was very much like <laughs> very much like Montana. It was beautiful, and uh, that's where they lived out the last six years. Did so, they have any uh, evens around them? Did any evens come up and interact with them, or or were they totally isolated at that point? I think they were. There was a community up there somewhere, but uh, it was it was much smaller than the the main the main civilization was around the equator, and all their uh-huh. manufacturing all their manufacturing and supply and everything was around the equator. Did they have lakes, rivers, water? Yeah, they had bodies of water. They had strange kind of animals. Uh, uh, I've covered all that in the book as best I could, based strictly on the commander's diary. And uh-huh. he was he was very he was very. Uh, Helpful. He wrote down everything he could. Yeah, he had a lot of time. <laughs> so he had he had duties, and um, of course, if there, well, we don't know about that. They were there were a dozen men, so we don't know what they did for a sex life, unless they were. Oh, well, well, we don't know. We don't know what happened, how that worked out. But you know, he, the commander did say he became very attracted to the uh, female who was helping them, and he really liked her because she was very warm. Person, very helpful person. That's all we know. Uh, whether or not any kind of interplanetary uh, uh, love life went on, we have we have no idea. Could have. We could have. Do we know if they're able to copulate? If a human and a and an even uh, are they physically able to copulate? That wasn't revealed by the commander. I don't know. What did they do for? Did they have recreation? And if they did, what did they do? For- fun for recreation they had games they played um we tried we tried to teach them how to play softball and football but they simply could not get used to the idea that the ball could not hit the ground they thought it was, <laughs> they had, that the ball wasn't allowed to hit the ground first so no matter what we did we couldn't get them to understand that and uh, they had a game they played where they all stood in places like chess chess pieces and moved around and I covered it as best I could based on the uh, commander's, commander's diary. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, okay, so at the same time, they sent uh, an equivalent group to Earth. Is that do I do I understand it by exchange? Yeah, just one, just one, one, one person. Oh, one person. Uh-huh. So what did we do? What did our world? Yeah, with this one person they had. We, we took him all over the place. I think we took him to Washington, and uh, he. Uh, we, we really gave them the grand tour, as far as I know. How do we know that they're male or female? Or how do you dis- differentiate? They were similar, similar sort of uh, genitalia to what we have, I think. I'm not, uh-huh. So uh, sexual dimorphism, men's uh, bigger and stronger, that kind of thing. They were. But, not, we were bigger and stronger. We were bigger. But between their male and female, was the male uh, bigger and stronger than their female? Somewhat, somewhat, not very much, not very much. They look, they all look very much alike. Uh, the commander had trouble telling them apart for a long time. He said they, they all looked the same to him. And did they have any kind of like computers? Like <laughs> humans are addicted to computers. Did they have any kind of uh, televisions or computers or anything like that? Oh, the thing on their belt. I'm they just asking. They did not have any. They did not have any kind of a planet-wide communication broadcasting arrangement. So the people were kept sort of in a, sort of kept in the dark, really, uh, and didn't care. Uh, they, North Korea. <laughs> yeah, anything important was related to them through that device on their belt, and through this mirrored tower. Now you have to remember that all we have from the commander was about. Uh, 15 sheets out of his diary. That's all we have. Wow. So all of this is based on that. That's all That's all that Anonymous was able to reveal. Okay, so he had much longer diary and we only got 15 pages. Okay, so... Yeah, a 3,000 uh, 3, page book came out of the debriefing. They were debriefed for a solid year after they got back. Yeah, I would imagine. So what else do you want to tell us before we go to the Yellow Pages book? What else do you want to tell us about... Um, what happened while they were there? And well, by far the most dramatic event related by the commander and passed on by Anonymous was the confrontation that took place 
when number 308, our people all had three-digit numbers. They, they were take, Their names were taken away, and they were given three-digit numbers for identification. Mm -hmm. And 308 died on the way to Serpo. Oh, what happened? He had a pulmonary embolism. Wow. He, he was our uh, pilot. He was our alternate pilot. We had two pilots in the group. We had two biologists, two pilots, two linguists, uh, two doctors. The one that died was one of the pilots. Uh-huh. Uh, when they got to Serpo, the commander asked for his body, and they told him that his body no longer existed. And he said, what do you mean it no longer existed? They said, well, we, we have used the body. And he said, they took, we took, they took all the blood from the body, and they were using the body to bioengineer other, other creatures. Oh, and they, wow. And when the commander found this out, he was irate. He said, he said, the body belongs to the United States planet Earth. Uh-huh. And, uh, which was kind of funny, really. And, uh, so he said, we want to see what's left of the body and the, the woman who was translating said she was very upset that he was getting upset. And they said, it would, we can't do that. He said, she said, take us to where it is or we're going to go get our guns and go there ourselves. <laughs> oh. So it, it was, it was a brewing confrontation that could have gotten pretty nasty, although the commander acknowledged that there was no way they, they could possibly win anything like that. But, right. Uh, so finally, she said, "I will go get the doctor and bring him back here." And she went, and they got him, and he spoke English. Oh wow! And he explained to them that they were using the parts of the body to create and bioengineer other creatures. He didn't lie about it; he just spoke about it, matter of factly, like you know, this is what we do here. And the commander said he wanted to see those creatures. Uh huh. So they took him on a tour of that building, and he was completely revolted by what he saw. And then he what said did he they create? To... Huh? What did what kind of things did they create? Well, he, saw, he saw grotesque, very grotesque and hideous creatures that they were they were uh, putting together there. And, uh huh. Uh, th then he said he wanted to see what they had done with 308's body, and they took him to see this creature that was part even part human. It had large hands and feet. Was, You're breaking up. Can you try adjusting your mic again? I'm sorry. They took him to see this creature that was uh, cloned uh -huh. from, from uh, 308. And the commander was completely revolted by all of this and said in the diary, he said, I have seen the dark side of this civilization. He didn't understand anything about uh, anything at all about cloning or DNA at that point. Don't forget, they left they, they left our planet in 1965. Right. And we didn't discover DNA until 1960. 1960. Uh, Watson and Crick got the uh, Nobel Prize in 1962. So our people did not really know what they were doing, what, what these people were doing. To them, it was all science. To us, right. it seemed like To us, it seemed like something evil. Well, that kind of makes uh, sense out of something that Robert Heinlein said, and I think it was uh, Time Enough for Love in 1973. He said, we don't own our – the our DNA belongs to the universe. So he was rumored to be some kind of insider, so that makes sense. These these uh, beings thought that, okay, it's just DNA. We're just going to use it and see what we can create. And we – so they didn't really hold, I guess, their body sacred or have ritual around – uh, uh, some a death or anything is, is that well they true? did they did they had funerals they had funerals yes and they buried them and they had a they had a little uh, ritual they indulged in at at a funeral type thing uh, they evidently they didn't use their own species bodies for bioengineering <laughs> they didn't have to you know were they unaware of the the uh, the human need to mourn and have ritual and burials and ceremony. Well, you know, they had their own version of it, so they must have realized it, but they decided they were going to have that body available to them was too good an opportunity to turn down. Mm -hmm. Were there other aliens uh, that uh, our team uh, saw besides uh, the Serp Serpo people? Yes, there were others there. 
And, Tell uh, us about them, please. Well, while they were eating in a big eating hall there, one of them walked by, and the commander was astounded, and he asked her, EB number two, who was that or what was that? And she said, just a visitor. And that was, all she, that was all she needed to say. And he, he realized immediately that they had probably had a lot of visitors there. What did the other uh, being look like? He said it looked something like a praying mantis kind of being. That okay. Kind of very, very strange looking. Wow. Okay, anything else we need to cover before we switch to the yellow pages? Well, that's about it. Uh, they, they did explore the entire planet. Uh, they, wrote every, they wrote everything up. They all kept the diaries, both written and verbal, using cassette recorders. And uh, they took about 3,000 photos, all of which is bottled up at Bowling Air Force Base in a vault somewhere. Wow. Is there any reason, that, a reasonable reason, why uh, the public uh, shouldn't know about uh, a lot more of this material? Well, I mean, you know, common sense would tell you that if, if we were to reveal the kind of technology that we got out of this, it would be astounding. Mm-hmm. It could revolutionize our, our, all of our science. Right. It could help us immensely. Yeah, well, that's not what the military uh, is trying to do. Yeah, they're not trying to help us. <laughs> then, then, they're not. They don't exist to try and to try and help civilians. I want to uh, go back. I want to. I want to uh, segue a little bit and then go back to the old pages thing. When I was researching your information uh, for this show, I went into YouTube and I I searched um, uh, Serpo and, and Ebens, and it came up with Johnston Atoll. Now, this is very significant for me because I was on Johnson Atoll from December of 95 till February of 97. And when I was there, I was taken underground by, I don't know what they'd be, I called them grays, for the lack of any other word for How them. How many fingers they have? Well, they might have been grays because they only had the, the uh, three fingers and one thumb. But in 2009, I don't know if you remember this article that Dr. Michael Salo wrote, that apparently there was some kind of meeting. I don't know if it was uh, Obama, but maybe it was his team. Um, there was a little tiny island, a cow, right to two miles from Johnson Atoll, and they said it was the Serpo Evans. Can you shed any light on that? When I was there, I saw these grays, and so can you shed any light on this meeting that Dr. Salo mentions? When, when, were, you th- when were you there? I was there from ninety five to uh, ninety from December ninety five to February in ninety seven. But Dr. Michael Sala wrote an article about a meeting that happened in two thousand nine on Johnson Atoll. Now Johnson Atoll was closed as a military installation, and I've been trying to track it down. It was somewhere between two thousand one and two thousand five. I think it was closer to two thousand. 2000 to 2005. I think it was closer to 2000. The official story is that it's been shut down and all the the military base demolished. But now, you know, it was it was a, obviously a group U.S. extraterrestrial base. The moment I landed there in '95, somebody came over and told me, "Congratulations, you've an, you've landed on a group U.S. Uh, ET military base," and that blew my mind because he didn't know me from Adam. And then I. A year into my contract, I was shown the extraterrestrials in an underground base. And then in 2009, Dr. Sala wrote about the the Ebens from Serpo. So I just wonder if you had any information on that. Yeah, it's in my book. I, the 2009 was, was a meeting on Johnston Atoll. That's correct. And we invited, at that particular meeting, we invited representatives of, the, uh, of Russia, of China, the Vatican, we uh, we invited a lot of people from outside the country to that meeting to meet the. What was uh, that meet- meeting about? Do you have any idea? It was just another one of the trips back here. They ca- they they came back eight times after the uh, after the return of the uh, of the. By the way, only seven returned of the twelve. Okay, uh, we'll get back to that. Yeah. So it was just and- a it's it's the, what they do. They periodically come and meet with us. And is there a, a purpose for the meetings or? Well, you can so, just imagine. You can just imagine the kind of information that's being exchanged. I right. mean, these people have explored the galaxy. 
So uh, just think of what we probably learned from them. They're very free, free and open with their information. Okay, so, so they're getting it. The tops of our uh, world governments are getting it, and us little peeves here don't get anything. We're just like the Ebens on their planet. You know, we have our cell phones. We're all being monitored just, just like the Ebens on <laughs> Serpo. It's, nothing's changed. Exactly. And keep in mind that they didn't take us to meet their top scientific people. They, their position was they had very little to learn from us. That we that we were the uh, we were the new kids on the block, and uh, they let us li they let us meet all their low level people. We never met their top scientists. We never met their top people. Do so, they have they do they have like a a world leader or do they have a council? They had a council. Yes, they had a council of governors that that were in power for uh, for their lifetime, mm -hmm. and uh, they ran the whole show. Yeah. So they were kind, but they really didn't. Uh, ha like have China. they <laughs> have they had any interactions with our world leaders and their real world leaders that you are aware of? Not Anybody? that I'm aware of, but I'm sure I'm sure that did happen. You know, of course it okay. happened. It must have happened. All right, it so did. back on Serpo, it's time to come back home. They've been there. How many years were they there? Twelve instead of ten, or something? <laughs> 13, 13 years. Oh, 13 years. No, and they didn't all come back. Right. So let me ask no. you, what, what happened that they didn't come back after 10 years? Why did they stay longer? Their time their time pieces stopped working. They they lost track of time. You know, uh -huh. Serpo, has, Serpo has two sons, and it never gets dark. So they they tried to coordinate with Earth, with Earth's system, but they somehow they couldn't keep it going. They're, they lost their batteries or something. I don't know. They wound up staying <laughs> They stand up staying there for 13 years instead of 10 years. Okay. How, was, how did that work for uh, for those people, the humans that live there? Uh, uh, you know, they say that they, to have a healthy life, you have to sleep and sleep in the dark. How did they adjust to no dark time to sleep at all? Well, they got used to it. Don't forget they did move to that northern quadrant. So my own feeling is that they had a pretty cushy lifestyle. They had nothing to do, okay. really. They explored the planet. They, uh, you know... They brought all kinds of books with them and re and musical tapes and I think they I think they had a pretty relaxing time and they got a very very large bonus when they got back. So uh, it probably so why didn't they all come back? Yeah. So what well, happened? Two of, them, they... two of them decided to stay there. Wow. So what what was behind that decision? Can you tell us a little bit more about no, that? No, uh, anonymous anonymous didn't get into details as to why they decided to stay. They just liked it. They just liked it there. They got used to it, and they liked mm -hmm. the people. And uh, so, two two more died on Serpo. So that oh, made wow. three that made three deaths, and two stayed there. So only seven returned. Do you have any more information on the two that died? What happened? According to Anonymous, they stayed in touch with them until 1988 uh, using that communications device that we had working. Mm -hmm. And after that, after that, we don't know what happened to them. We don't know how, why they died. How they well, died, if they died. No, no, I'm saying. Stayed, no, okay, but we got confused. So we don't know what happened to the two that stayed. The two additional that died on Serpo, do we know what made them die? Yeah, yeah. One of them was the doctor who died of pneumonia, and the other one was the security man who who died of a uh, an accident. He fell, and uh, somehow died that way. And they tried to uh, they tried the uh, the Evans tried to revive him. They did the best they could this time. Uh, they were very compassionate, very helpful, and they were unable to save his life. So we had seven that returned. Do we know the names of these seven, where they're living? Are they still alive? Any information on the seven that returned? No. no they, these, all their, these people, their identities were taken away from them before they left, all of them. Right. So they, they, are, they are reintegrated into our society now, from what you know, with aliases, new names, identities? According to what I know, they were given a very large bonus. They were given the option of staying in the military or leaving. And the, the last one died in 2002 in Florida. Okay, all. so all seven that returned are now deceased. Yes. Okay. They they wouldn't have been that old in in the six leaving in the 60s. They would have only 
Well, they could have been, yeah. It might have been they the been 80s or 90s. I don't know. It's, it been still alive. Okay. But uh, their lives well, were shortened by the radiation that they had uh, they had absorbed there. They were sub they were well, subjected to very high doses of radiation on Serpo. Right, and that correlates with another whistleblower about being in space too much. You you it, you get these side effects. Exactly. Okay, so the yellow pages. What was that? When they landed in, in April of 1964, they presented us with something called the Yellow Book. It was not exactly a book. It was uh, it was like a more more like a, a lucite or a plastic thing, and when you opened it, it uh, showed you pictures and spoke to you in whatever language you currently were speaking or thinking, and it apparently had the ability to. Uh, to com to converse in 80 different Earth languages. Wow! Universal uh, translator, translator yeah. right? Exactly, exactly. And uh, it showed pictures of our planet going way back to 2000 BC. And wow! These, they were like holographic images. As you opened the book, uh, these these pictures would appear, and. Uh, the person that read, tried to read the book said he spent 22 hours, and, and, and once you closed the book, you could not resume from where you left off. You had to start all over again. And he Were said you he allowed spent, to just leave it open, and maybe you could uh, have team tag people just shifting and watching it or something? Say that again. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't understand that. Were you able to leave the book open and maybe have a team of people read it while other people slept? They could just keep it open and get the whole story? Well, Anonymous, one of the people who tried to read it was a, one of the DIA people said he spent 22 hours reading it and he, he feels it would take a whole life. He felt it would take a whole lifetime to go to read the whole book. That's to read what he said. Book. Yeah. Okay. And it didn't have any fast forward or search it. System. So no, just, no, evidently, I, but but the scenes from the past of our planet must have must have been authentically must have been the actual event, something like the Akashic records, because you know how could they go back go back in time and take take movies or photographs of these events? So they must have had access to uh, an, some sort of etheric uh, repository. Of history of our planet, so the whole thing is really rather remarkable. And uh, you mentioned something about time travel. Could that be a, a, a factor in this? Well, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah, because to go through a wormhole, when you go through a wormhole, my understanding is that you're basically traveling through time. And uh, so this ties in with Einstein's idea that. Time is the fourth dimension, and that was also Minkowski's theory, which he proved mathematically. So that when you're traveling through a wormhole, it's instantaneous because you're re basically going through the fourth dimension, something like that. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not clear about the mathematics of all of that. So when this book was giving you views back in time, was it? Uh, giving you views based on where humans lived, or did it show you scenes of mountaintops and, and animals in you know in the jungle, or uh, how was it? I think it geared? was a history. It was a history of our planet, basically, and I, evidently they selected what they thought were important junctures or events in that history and incorporated them into the book. We've heard of a device. Where was it? Bosnia or Transylvania or Romania? That's right. It was one of those places. Peter Moon gave a report of a device that you could uh, you would lay upon a table, lie upon a table, and it would give you the history of the Earth based on your DNA. So it was somehow geared for the individual um, that wanted to see the history of the Earth, or maybe it wasn't even a conscious thing, but it was related to your DNA. It gave you what was relevant to you as a person who you are now and it, it sounds like almost like a similar device although that they thought might have been from the Anunnaki 
because it was under the pyramids. Yeah, no, the, the yellow book did not know, have a unique, did not know they were dealing with a unique individual, but they were able to decipher what language he spoke. That was all. Did they show nothing. things of like of, of, uh, like Jesus and Buddha, or what kind of things did, did they show that were important that we should know about? Yeah, there was there were scenes that appeared to show a Jesus-like person uh, did not identify him apparently as Jesus, but some sort of a spiritual, great spiritual leader that did come along around 2,000 years ago. Uh -huh. So that's that was part of the yes that was in the book. Wow. What other historical scenes did they show that might be relevant? I, I, I don't know. I don't know any more about it than that. I can't tell you any okay. more about it than that. But that's the book okay. the book exists somewhere in uh, at Bowling Air Force Base, I believe. And I don't know where it is, frankly, but you can just you can just imagine what we've learned from that thing. Well, I remember Linda Moulton Howe told me that she was shown a device that she, that did this uh, type of thing, and then William Cooper talked about uh, going to a meeting, and uh, there was a device that um, showed scenes from the past. I wonder if it's a separate device or if they same device. Well, maybe. Yeah. What did Linda say about it? Uh, she told me that she was shown a, a scene of of Jesus and the crucifixion. And then she said that, um, oh, 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 who's the Mars guy? Um, what's this guy? Andy. Hoagland. No, Hoagland. 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 Hoagland was shown. Hoagland, yeah. And, and this was 20 years ago when I still lived at State College, Pennsylvania. And they said that they were going, to, uh, the, the people who pulled her into this secret meeting said, we're looking for someone, and we're, we're going to do disclosure, we're looking for someone to be, to act on our behalf, you know, a, a public figure like yourself, Linda. And uh, so, but she, there was something that they said or did, and she thought it, she didn't want to participate on it. I can't remember what, what she said. It was, this is 20 plus years ago. So she, she did not want to be their spokesperson, or maybe they rejected her. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing up the story, but the, what stuck out in my mind, it was definitely um, these people were shown the historical Jesus, uh, you know, crucifixion thing. So I don't know if that was true or a manipulation. We don't know. Well, apparently the Evans, uh, Evans agreed with that idea because that apparently was shown in the Yellow Book, too. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. So, so, you know, I'm sure that uh, that was extremely an educational device for our people. Did it have any other functions besides uh, being a viewer of our, our history? This yellow book. No, no, but it was you know it was a it was a wonderful gift to give to the people of Earth as their uh, it was their um, gift to us, and it, it demonstrated how how they felt about wanting to be our friends and uh, establish a an ongoing diplomatic relationship with us, and apparently we've had that relationship now for uh, what. Uh, since 1978, so 30, 40 years. So let's go back to, we started with, it started World War II and, and Bird and, and this conflict we had. With are, are these Evens going to help us at all with this conflict we have with the reptilians? Well, see, that's why I started the book with that story. Uh -huh. was because when that craft crashed at Roswell, any advantage that the Nazis had with their Antarctic technology was now, has now been canceled out because we we this friendship we have with the Evans has probably allowed us to develop an incredible planetary defense and a, and, a, and a national defense that no other country in the world has. So, and, so maybe technologically the uh, Evans were more advanced than the. Reptilians. Well, evidently, because they had they had been involved in a in a war that oh. lasted that lasted a hundred years, and uh, they defeated their enemies using uh, particle beam weapons. And if you know anything about particle beam weapons, they're much more powerful than nuclear technology, and that's probably why they didn't care really about our nuclear technology. They they had stuff that was far more powerful 
And uh, I believe that we actually used particle beam weapons in the first Gulf War. So we, if we did, then we certainly must have gotten gotten it from them. So they're not afraid that humanity gets the same weapons that they have. They're not. They are not in fear of us in any way. Evidently it's not. Taking that that equipment away. Are are, are these beam things ra- uh, radioactive? No, no, it's not. It's not radioactive uh, technology. It's it, it it projects a beam of ions or electrons at such a high speed and packs each 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 electron or ion packs like a million volts of power oh. so that when it hits the target it literally takes it apart at the molecular level and nothing can withstand this kind of a weapon wow so uh if we have one of those in orbit can you just imagine the advantage that gives us Wow, we probably do. So, so we're looking at the what's going on. So we start with the, with with the uh, bird, and he was defeated. Now we have the particle. What do you think's going on? We've got this faction. Uh, Karen Hughes uh, reported that uh, there's these Homo Capensis, the large-headed beings that might be in control of the Vatican. We've got this uh, reptilian factor. Whether it's, uh, they're Dracos, or or uh, what? Who's in control of this planet? What in your mind? What's going on? I don't think that the reptilians that helped the Nazis uh, are in control any, at all. From what I've read, they live so far underground, like two or three hundred miles underground, and uh, they've been here much longer than we have. And they have their own little civilization here, as far as I know. I don't know what their current, I don't know what their current goals are or their plans. Or uh, I hear from Bob Dean that many of them are very friendly to us, and many of them are very nice, and they're not all evil. And uh, there's no question, though, that there is some kind of, there is some kind of interplanetary, interstellar. Uh, uh, let's just say diplomatic relationships and entities and things going on, just like on our planet. And we've got to we've got to be a player to survive. Mm-hmm. So, how does the Serpo book end? What What are the final things that you can convey to our listeners about what you learned from doing all this research? And well, the book what ends with the book ends with the realization that we have a very powerful. Um, friend in the galaxy, which uh, certainly ensures our survival in the long run. But then again, there are many other there are many other civilizations on this planet that may be even more powerful than the Eben. So who knows? Who knows what's going on? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, we're just speculating here. We don't really have all the answers. We're just trying to figure it out. I mean, it certainly looks like we have. Uh, like this Illuminati power elite that doesn't really give a damn about us, that controls and manipulates, and uh, there's a lot of greed and uh, power and control. That doesn't even seem doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem like a, the best society. But here we have the Ebens. They're not. They don't have much of a. Their society's pretty similar. Oh. Uh, I was just hoping there might be like a Star Trekian Federation that we're going to get into the the universe and uh, the well, galaxy and yeah, travel Martin around. And, so yeah, then we have other reports like have, have you ever heard of the link by A. R. Borden, the Linkage Institute, and the, about these meetings that are having they're having every I think it's every January with a lot of different species called the Link or the Linkage Institute. No, I don't. But I'm, I'm, what I'm working on now is trying to understand how all of this relates to the fourth dimension because so many of the aliens that we've dealt with are coming from another dimension they're able to they're able to become invisible and they're able to uh, leave to, to become visible when they feel like it and and there a lot of their spaceships can do the same so I think until we understand the fourth dimension we're not going to be able to get to the bottom of any of this and I think our top people, especially the military, are all, have all been working in that direction, uh, training psychics, training people who can uh, can can use telepathy. 
this is where it's all going. We're not dealing with a physical reality here. We're dealing with way beyond a physical reality. And once we have to understand that before we can get anywhere. And, and, and that's what I'm most interested in right now, is the, right. The, the, way, the way the fourth dimension comes into play here. Well, I do a lot of astral traveling, projection, remote viewing, and I can't begin to tell how I do it. It's just something that I do and happens, and I've had a, a lifetime where I've dealt with uh, interdimensionals and ghosts and extraterrestrials. So I've experienced it, I've uh, done it, and I've been on the receiving end of it, and it's quite profound. And then we noticed that our governments are investing a lot of time, energy, and money in their uh, remote viewing and psychic, like you mentioned. So there is a mystery there. Uh, how, so do, that, how, do you th- how do you think it all ties in with the afterlife? Well, I, what Willie Stryber said, uh, you were probably there at one of the conferences, that uh, the, the dead are often there on the ships. You know, you exactly. Have exactly. So, you know, they're all in the fourth dimension, and this, this is what right. I'm trying to put all this together. I, I'll come out and say I, I had quite an interesting experience when – uh, Michael Jackson died. I was in the middle of a, a deposition on the courthouse, and all of a sudden uh, we we take a break, and they say Michael Jackson died, and we go back into the deposition, and um, Michael Jackson is just right there with me as my heart went into, um, you know, I was so stressed out, my heart went into uh, what do you call it? Um, arrhythmia, arrhythmia. And, and, and Michael Jackson said in my ear, <laughs> Tell him you're sick, because I didn't know what to do. Right, I was like scared, and and I it just popped out of me. I don't feel good. And then they they broke up, and they, and anyway, so I was haunted with him for like two days, and then finally I said to Sasha, I said, "Honey, Michael Jackson's haunting me because his songs wouldn't go out of my head." And I, I you know I wasn't a fan, I wasn't a groupie, you know. And so we finally did um, a hypnosis, and and Michael Jackson came. Tell me all this stuff about you know himself. So I've had that happen. That's not the first time in my life I've had. I'm like the kid in the sixth sense. So so definitely the, the dead and then the extraterrestrials they're all coming through. You know I've had the material materialize. They came through walls. They came through doors. They came through windows. I've experienced it. It's it's very typical, just like the books. And so I know when people are reporting it, it's like, I go, yeah, I, I've been there, got that T-shirt. So there is some strong correlation that they can go interdimensional. And we do, too. We die. Where do we go when we die, right? I, I, We're going interdimensional. I, I've seen hundreds of people as I facilitated them in journey work that access uh, these uh, mm-hmm. all kinds of uh, time, space, uh, size uh, changes in their phenomenology. And where do we come from when we're born? You know, so we're coming through another dimension. So I, I think you're on the right track there. I think that all of that, yes, all of that. Has, I think Whitley Strieber was uh, didn't realize what he was up against in, in the early stages of when he wrote Communion, but I think now he has a much, a much better appreciation for what's going on. And mm-hmm. certainly a lot of the abduction... A lot of the abduction cases are clearly they walked through walls, they went through windows, they went through. So, you know, until we can get, I think our military knows all this. They have a very good appreciation, especially the NSA. So uh, this is where we have to start. This is where we have to start uh, investigating. This is where we need to be putting our investigative information this will be you know, Sn- Snowden has uh, sort of hinted that he's got some of this kind of material. What did he say exactly? I uh, just know that, uh, that um, there's stuff that was coming out on Facebook that he has uh, information on uh, just what data we really have uh, on the ET presence here. And he, he didn't say what it was specifically, but he keeps hinting around. He's, he's piecing it out so he can uh, extend his safety and fame, I suppose. Now, are you, are you both of the opinion that the planet itself and the entire Human race is going to morph into a, into the fourth dimension. That's what well, that's, that's what awaits. That's awaits what us. the theory is: is that uh, when we are in alignment with the galactic core, which apparently we have done, that we're going to have a, a global awakening, and that there will be a, a period where we will shift into. We might actually be shifting 
and it's not going to be that noticeable. But go ahead, you want to say something? Oh, just that uh, uh, Chris Hardy uh, uh, has, has really uh, said that you know, now we are lined up with the galactic core, which is activating uh, some of our latent uh, DNA, uh, and now is the time for uh, that part of us to develop, which is a spiritual part, which is a part that allows empathy with the other uh, people who are ready uh, to change their consciousness and it only takes a three uh, percent change to change the morphogenic field and and there's actually resonances that hardy has been identifying uh that when, when people meditate together you're probably familiar with the uh experiments in cincinnati where they brought down the crime rate but uh greg braden has done a lot of research that shows that collective meditations of various kind brings this um spirituality which is uh, beyond individuals. It's a collective. And so I, it's, I'm hopeful. And anyway, the thing about being helpful then is that um, if you're wrong and you, and you get killed and, uh, and uh, you believe that you had more to life than that and you were wrong, it don't matter. But if, if, if you were right, that's cool too. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of this relates to the, I think, to the pineal, to the pineal gland somehow. Yes. And uh, right. what's, what's been happening is that the calcification of the pineal gland has been preventing us from reaching certain spiritual goals. And we have, I think we have to get that somehow straightened out. Yeah, one of the things uh, that Moses Ma uh, was doing these studies of meditators uh, who uh, uh, they seems that around the pineal there are a spiritual uh, – uh, a new brain starts developing, and in uh, heavy meditators, there's these blue crystals that once they're ex- excised from the skull of a, of a lifelong meditator, keep on generating and, and increasing, and they're blue. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. I think that's our destiny eventually. Uh, I think the Illuminati are trying to prevent that. Uh, from what I'm gathering, I don't know. Yes, sure. they're trying to keep us in the material and, and from realizing that our spiritual possibilities. But now that the light from the center of the galaxy is uh, shining upon us, uh, there's hope. And even though we still have, uh, you know, ISIS and 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 uh, terrible um, lower forms going, there's the there is the possibility that if enough of us um, meditate uh, and uh, feel the empathy for all the humans and even the ones that seem so difficult if we can somehow address their very legitimate needs for uh, safety and uh, food and uh, respect for their consciousness uh, that, that we can change the world uh, I yeah. like to hope so anyhow yeah I think so I think that's where we're headed and I think the aliens a lot of the alien groups are trying to help us but uh, some some are not uh, so we, you know we got to we got to sort out the good guys from the bad guys so your other book was about uh, the different alien species. What would you like? We only have about, I don't know, six times left. What would you like to tell us about your other book? What's the title? Yeah, what was the title? Here it is. The, the Secret History of Extraterrestrials, Advanced Technology, and the Coming New Race. Well, the purpose of that book was to put together what's been happening with our contacts with ETs, uh, mm-hmm. just, just sort of a overview of over the years, starting with the Adamski story and going through Richard, through, uh, through Gear, uh, Greer, uh, and Stan, uh, Stanton Friedman and Linda Howe. In other words, just give, give people a overview of what's been going on because most people are not familiar with all of this and that was the purpose of it. And those, those I know article, she- yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was saying, uh, I noticed that you mentioned Helen Wamba, the late Helen Wamba, and I, what I recall from her experiments is that she would regress, let's say, about 100 people in a room simultaneously. Uh, she would progress them into the future and then have them uh, write on a sheet that she had passed out what they had seen. And so these people were accessing, uh, there seemed to be like four or five future histories that they were accessing uh, where the human race was going. Do you remember that information, that book? Yeah, yeah. And, and after she died, Chet Snow continued her work. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. I became. To, I, I know Chet very well, and I wrote a, a whole article for Landis Rising on that on that story, that whole story. Uh-huh. Uh huh. 
the few about what they say about the future. But you know, I don't think anything is carved in stone. And uh, Chet was off on a lot of years. He he got the timing way off. So right. he lost a lot of people along the way because of that. However, you know, psychics frequently don't get the timing right at all. That's nothing new. But they do get the events correct. So we don't know. We don't really know. It's interesting what you say about et etched in stone. Um, my, my studies of the ancient uh, civilizations uh, make me know they have something like our Brown's uh, gas where you can turn – uh, stone into uh, cement and then it hardens again. In Angkor Wat in Cambodia, they have mile long single stones of sandstone that were, uh, there's no seams in them. They were made by this thing. So etched in stone is, is uh, kind of a fluid thing, even. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. literally, literally etched in stone. Well, anyway, that's my circle story and uh, I hope that uh, you found it interesting. Well, that was oh, fascinating. We really appreciate that. Um, is, did we miss anything? I thought we did a pretty good. Uh, anything that else from the Serpo story that we need to convey to our listeners? Well, basically, it's just that the door is open to us exploring the galaxy now because here's a planet just like our planet that's 39 light years from our Earth and is really a gateway to the galaxy, especially with their help. And we have a, a nice place to live there that we call Little, little Montana. So we could, literally start a, we could literally start a community there. And maybe we already have. Maybe we have. So it, they, probably is there... have they probably already built the gambling casinos, and <laughs> we're all set. We're all set. <laughs> Are there any indications that they had any other exchange programs? Or, yeah, what about life on Mars and the moon? Do we have any uh, information on that? Any basis there? No, I don't, know? Know anything about, I don't know anything about that. I, I do know that we've, we've had, we've had uh, colonies on Mars and the moon since 1962. That much I know. So how, what's your website? Give people a chance to hook into your uh, webs. It's www.et-secrethistory.com. And I put together a lot of information there, way beyond Serpo. So uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of videos, and a lot of uh, connection, a lot of links. And you can buy my books through that website. You can click through to Amazon or to the publisher. Or if you want signed copies, uh, you can buy them there, too. Okay, signed copies. Oh, I had one more question about the, did they go to the moon? Have we been to the moon? Was that uh, all staged, Hollywood, or the Apollo program? And what about uh, Apollo? Think, oh, we, we've been to the moon. I think you have to go go uh, ask Ed Mitchell about all that. He's got a lot to say about that. Right. Have, are you familiar with the uh, the Apollo 20? Um, they, they apparently continued after the last one, which was, I forget, 14 or something, 15. 16, I've, seen I picture, I've seen those photographs of the Apollo 18 flight where they showed that oriental-looking woman, woman in a yes. suspended anime. I've seen that, and it looked it looked very real to me. It looked very yeah. real to me. Great. Well, I saw uh, on the Mars base they had a statue. Uh, there was a, a. I actually put it up on my extraterrestrialcontact.com. They had a statue that the uh, the little probe that's on Mars running around. Captured and it's a, and she looks just like uh, the the creature that's in suspended animation, the being I should say, on the moon. It looks like oh, her. Oh no, kidding! Is that right? That's interesting. And the spaceship, yeah. the spaceship was intact, right? And they found the space, the entire spaceship intact. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Len, for coming on our show today. It's been such a delight. To thank to know you. you thank you, Janet and Sasha. I have enjoyed it very much. Great. We'll see you in Nevada. Yeah, we'll yeah. see you. Okay. okay. Try and make it, okay? Okay. 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 okay.